Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. Hello and welcome, esteemed participants and distinguished guests. Welcome to The Honest Critique's G20 Roundtable Conference, where we gathered to discuss and dissect the significant development that unfolded during the recent G20 summit held in New Delhi. The summit, which took place from September 9 to September 10, 2023, witnessed groundbreaking moments and historic decisions that have left an indelible mark on the global stage. Allow me to introduce our esteemed panel of experts, each renowned in their respective fields, who will provide invaluable insights, perspectives on the outcomes and implications of the G20 summit. Convulsible, former Foreign Secretary of India, Michael Kugelman, Director of South Asian Institute at the Wilson Center, United States, Andrew K. P. Leung, Independent China Strategies based out of Hong Kong, Satoru Nagao, Fellow at Hudson Institute based in Tokyo, Japan, Ifrahim Inbar, President at Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, Elizabeth Sidropoulos, Chief Executive of the South African Institute of International Affairs, Peter Kuznick, Professor of History and Director, Nuclear Studies Institute, American University, Khalid Al Yamani, former Foreign Minister of Yemen, and Senia Kondratrieva, independent journalist based out of Moscow and founder of Russia Wild. Thank you all for taking your time and speaking to us on this G20 roundtable discussion. Given the multifaceted nature of G20 summit's outcomes and complexities of India's role on the global stage, let's begin our discussion with a foundational question for all our panelists. How do you assess India's G20 presidency in terms of India's emergence as a major global power? And what challenges and opportunities does it present in the realm of foreign policy, particularly regarding India's commitment to strategic autonomy and its efforts to advocate for the global South's interest and priorities on the international stage? In, in order to understand the G20 India outcome, we need to see uh, the approaches of India towards of uh, issues of the global south and uh, issues of uh, of of India's uh, traditional history of of non alignment. And now they have a new concept of using uh, strategic autonomy, but is it's that same old concept that been reframed. Uh, to present um, this new concept of strategic autonomy. Um, India was all the time very sensitive towards these issues of uh, independence and, uh, and, and, and preventing uh, India's and, and the global south from, uh, from uh, major powers' influences. And, and from that point, I think India is approaching the Chinese uh, policy towards the the region and the world, um, uh, but it's very important to to to, to see, for example, what's the the G twenty India approach in when it comes to global south. We see, for example, uh, the the work of one year of discussion and, and negotiation uh, resulted in the in the AU. Um, membership in the group. I think it's very important to have an African voice uh, present uh, in, 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 in this global forum. And it's also is different issues like reforming the financial international financial institutions is very important for India. It's important for our countries. And also to, to see that uh, financial institutions reflecting the interest of our countries and our regions in the world. And, uh, and uh, also the there is an the issue of the the debt restructuring is very um, uh, fundamental in 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 addressing uh, the sovereign debt uh, restructuring and and also to get more financing for the climate uh, change uh, india during this uh, g20 was working on these 
all these topics and with the specifics and and uh, and it took in took India and the uh, and the Indian diplomacy uh, so long discussion within the framework of the United Nations or the bilateral to address these issues. And uh, I think uh, if we consider the the outcome of uh, of G20 India. We we see that India was presenting its image as uh, coming. Um, I mean, one of the major powers in in, in international relations, uh, and in in this, the, India is fighting with China, uh, though in diplomatic terms. Uh, in the who is representing the global south? For example, if you see. Uh, the two years ago, when uh, the president of China presenting his uh, global economic uh, initiative, was trying to present himself as defender of the global south, and uh, and if you compare the two uh, uh, diplomacies, you see that the Indian diplomacy is more effective because India is working in the. In the in the international fora uh, for quite long time with the global south concept and working for 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 the coordination between countries of the south, uh, for example, when you see the how effective is India in the G seventy seven as an example, uh, but this is not the case of of China. China just came to be active in international relations and and when its ambitions with the uh, with the BRI initiative and other initiatives in the, in the UN. They have more than three initiatives launched at the UN. One is the security, global security. One is the global economy. And, 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 uh, and it's all reflecting the ambitious ambitions of, of China to, to be not the China we know from 2010, but, uh, but the China of uh, GBNG. Uh, of the of the president of uh, the, the the communist party um also it's very important to see uh g20 india uh in the framework of this confrontation between china and 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 the united states and the west uh and in that uh the west and the united states had decided that it's better to have uh an ally that is that is democratic in institutions and uh, and uh, respond to to checks and, and balances than having a partner that is that is a communist that is uh, that is really uh, uh, an authoritarian regime and and, and 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 India is playing that that role although India has some issues internal issues when it comes to the, the racial divide and racial issues and political issues, but it's still a democratic regime. So if we look into this outcome, we will see that uh, the meeting in, 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 in Delhi was a huge success for Indian foreign policy, for the global south, and for the cooperation of our countries. Uh, first of all, I, I'd like to congratulate India, actually, for the superb piece of diplomacy, uh, because uh, in the uh, presence of glaring uh, disagreement uh, over the Ukraine war amongst uh, some of the atten attending nations uh, and, and producing uh, um, um, a, a joint communique um, is no easy task. Um, but of course, that there has been accusations that on the Ukraine war, uh, the language is anything um, is is just anodyne. I mean, it's not uh, uh, any um, uh, kind of uh, drum beating. The communique also serves to highlight um, the need for um, low income and middle income countries for um, um, in their debt vulnerability. Um, again, uh, this is a, a not so subtle uh, kind of pointer uh, to the so-called uh, perceived debt, um, uh, debt trap uh, over by China's uh, Burn Road, even though uh, I must say that this is a great deal of overhyping. 
um, as far as the the narrative goes. But nevertheless, uh, it uh, uh, developing countries do suffer from a lack of um, adequate finance. It also highlights the um, the need for um, financial support for a just energy energy transition. Uh, so I think that is also uh, significant. Above all, the greatest achievement of India is the um, endorsement or the approval of the African Union uh, to join the uh, G20 uh, top table um, alongside with the European Union. Um, so I think that that's um, a, a great news uh, for the Global South, uh, in which, of course, China, of course, is in, um, a great champion. Um, but also, uh, last but not least, for India, uh, it is the agreement uh, of the G20 or the endorsement of the G20 uh, of uh, India, Middle East, and European Union, rail and sea link, um, uh, um, or is it term a corridor um, uh, alongside um, or almost copying uh, China's Burn Road corridor, uh, economic corridor. Um, so I, I think that this um, is a, a not so subtle uh, nod or a, a subtle challenge uh, to China's Burn Road. But nevertheless, I think that there's a great deal of hyping uh, in the Indian media, particularly because I had pe appeared on Indian television for the past couple of days, over 10 times, different stations. And I, I can't have feeling uh, that there is too much um, kind of triumphalism or anti-China kind of rhetoric, uh, as if the single ceiling is going to change everything. And I said so uh, openly uh, in the live um, uh, TV interview. And I said, well, um, China actually welcomes uh, this additional link because who is the largest trading countries in the world? China is um, the largest trading partner to 128 countries in the world, um, uh, uh, compared with only 57 of the United for the United States, let alone India. So even you have a link, you've got to trade. And so how much uh, can India trade um, uh, with the, the the rest of the world um, to usurp China's position um, as the central in its centrality in the global and supply and value chain? Uh, so I think that the, the, this reality seems to be lost sight of. Um, and of course, China is not against it. And as I said, uh, the more the world is connected, the more uh, China's global trading status will be further enhanced. Um, then the other thing is that um, uh, about President Xi's uh, absence, um, as if China is shunning the G20 in favor of the, the BRICS, I think there's, an, again, an overhyping uh, of the reality because uh, China embraces uh, globalization and the G20 countries, particularly with the inclusion of the European uh, African Union, is that much more important. And China uh, is, of course, is the largest um, country. China is written all over Africa in terms of investments, in terms of infrastructure linkages, in terms of trade, finance. Um, so uh, there's no way that China would give up the, the G20 in favor of the BRICS, as it were. Um, so I think that there's a great deal of overhyping. Um, and, and I think that this is uh, driven by a sense of rivalry uh, of the of India. After all, as far as the BRICS are concerned, the Chinese economy is the sum more than the sum total of the rest of the BRICS combined. So um, I think, again, uh, um, some people will lost sight of the reality. And I think the thing that China wants to make an enemy of India, China uh, uh, proposes uh, the Global Security Initiative, embracing all countries, the Global Development uh, uh, Initiative, embracing more countries. The more countries work together, the better it would be for, for, for China, for India, and for everybody. But unfortunately, uh, we are facing the world, uh, the re reality of global, uh, or what um, someone called the tragedy of Greek power um, geopolitics. Um, I think the Greek power geopolitics overshadowing a lot of things, overshadowing the Ukraine war, overshadowing the relationship between China and the United States, um, and and to some extent uh, underpins the kind of um, um, a tilt uh, towards the United States as far as India is concerned. But even though India is not uh, all, on, on all fours with the United States as far as the Ukraine position on the Ukraine war is concerned. 
Um, so I think that that's the reality we are facing. We are facing. We are we are in a multipolar and very complicated world. Um, what what presidency refers to the um, unprecedented uh, challenges and opportunities not seen in a hundred years. Um, particularly in China, is facing internal uh, challenges. Um, um, the um, uh, the property bubble. Um, the um, um, the un, uh, uh, the lack of of employment um, opportunities uh, for for its uh, graduates, even though its graduates um, out uh, is twelve million new graduates a year, um, and then talking about um, the um, uh, the worsening uh, demographics um, again that the uh, um, uh, the lack of employment of the youngsters um, doesn't seem to square. Uh, with the uh, perceived lack of um, manpower um, of, of a worsening uh, demographics. But here it is, they're both sides of the coin. Well, I think uh, to link India's presidency of the G20 to the rise of India as a significant global player uh, is giving too much importance to this one single event. Uh, I mean, in, India had already uh, achieved a certain economic status and had all, already achieved some uh, successes on the global stage in various uh, domains. Um, it has preserved its uh, strategic uh, autonomy. It, it has very friendly relations with all its uh, partners. Its relationship with the United States has improved remarkably, remarkably, where the United States is now our most important uh, partner. But this we have done while retaining our traditional uh, ties uh, with uh, Russia. Uh, we have not chosen sides over the Ukraine conflict. And coming back to the economy, uh, although, of course, in per capita terms, it may not sound impressive, but we are the fifth largest economy now. And uh, there is general opinion, uh, general consensus that by 2027 or thereabouts, we, may, we, be, we will be the third largest economy uh, overtaking Japan and Germany. Um, it, it just is that India's G20 presidency has come at the right moment. It is a rotational affair. It could have come later. <laughs> but it came at the right moment when India had already achieved considerable uh, influence globally. Uh, not, you know, even if you look at some of the uh, ideas that uh, India has been putting on the table, um, you know, resilient and uh, our infrastructure uh, uh, in terms of natural calamities and everything else, the solar alliance in which we uh, took the lead, look at the, the targets we have set ourselves in terms of uh, uh, renewable energy, and, and we, have, we are on the road to achieve them. We are the only country uh, which has actually uh, uh, achieved the, the targets of uh, agreed in the Paris Climate Change Conference uh, much earlier than 2030. Uh, on the financial side, financial side, we've done remarkably well. Our UPI, our unified payments uh, uh, system, our Aadhaar card and everything else, uh, it has become almost a potential model uh, for uh, developing countries in order to ensure uh, inclusive growth, including this direct benefit schemes and everything else. Uh, so as I said, <laughs> the G20 presidency has come at the right moment where India could credibly, credibly act on the international stage amidst the, the 20 most important powers uh, of the world. Now, the thing is that uh, our future growth, uh, our future uh, uh, capacity to influence uh, global governance in the direction we want uh, will depend on many, many factors. I might also mention that uh, uh, in the G20, we realized that the most, that we're not being able to do anything between the East and West uh, conflict over Ukraine. Uh, but there's also the North South uh, conflict, if you like, of a certain kind. And we felt that here we could play a more positive role, which is why just before uh, our foreign ministers, G20 foreign ministers conference, we convened a meeting of uh, the Global South, 125 leaders from the Global South attended. Uh, we noted their concerns, their expectations, 
we put them on the agenda of the G20. We steer the discussions within the G20 in the direction of giving more importance uh, to the concerns uh, of the global south. And in this, we've been successful. We've been successful. Uh, so going forward, uh, we have to move in the same direction, make sure that we can maintain high growth rates. Uh, we have to ensure that uh, uh, we continue to have uh, friendly ties with all the major powers uh, so that all the tensions that we are seeing on the global stage, uh, which actually can be a serious Im impediment not only to India's growth, but global growth as such, those are kept under control. And generally, we move forward towards more equitable and a more democratic uh, international system, which then would explain why we continue to be a member of BRICS and also of the SCO. Uh, the, for us, these are not anti-Western organizations. Uh, these are organizations which should focus on what I said earlier of making the international order more dem democratic and equitable. It cannot be done if we are aligned with the G7 plus. Uh, so there has to be an alternative platform on which we seek to balance uh, the G7, which all these decades has dominated uh, global governance and actually the international agenda. Other than that, uh, some of the things which our Chinese colleague mentioned, he not explained why President Xi Jinping did not attend. Um, uh, one can speculate why he did not, but I think uh, uh, China lost ground as a result of this. It was not at all visible uh, in the G20, and there always will be speculation as to why he chose to uh, stay away, uh, number one. Uh, number two, insofar as some of the projects uh, that are being promoted, the Chinese may feel that they are anti-Chinese in intent, but it's not the case. There are very valid, objective reasons uh, why there should be an emphasis on connectivity uh, all across the globe in order to boost uh, trade uh, and exchanges between peoples. And China certainly has the BRI, uh, but that, that can't be the only game in town. We've had earlier our own efforts at connectivity from uh, east, west to east, uh, through Myanmar, and Thailand, and on to uh, ASEAN countries, and potentially uh, Vietnam. Uh, we have now very strong ties with the Arab world, especially with the Gulf monarchies. We have an FTA with the UAE. We have excellent ties with the Saudi Arabia. Its crown princess has just made a state visit uh, to our country. Uh, there is tremendous potential there. Their own 2030 vision uh, 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 pro program, uh, is, which is basically axed on economic development of this region, uh, provides a lot of opportunities to everyone. China, of course, will gain from that because China has certain capacities. China's own relations with Saudi Arabia are very good. So we are not in competition <laughs> with China. It just is that we have our own interests, we have our own potential, and that potential and that interest uh, will be promoted uh, by through this a new corridor that has been created. Uh, and this fits into the ITU2, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, forum that has been created with the United States and Israel and UAE uh, and India. So this supplements it because this corridor will also go to Haifa uh, and on to Greece. Um, so I think. Uh, uh, in terms of Africa, we've got long-standing ties with Africa, far more, far more before before the Chinese entered into the scene. China has capacities; it is ut utilizing them to the full in expanding its ties uh, with Africa. But we have a different approach, different way of doing things. And finally, in terms of indebtedness, the issue of uh, uh, the indebtedness of the least of the least developed countries and developing countries in general has been on the agenda for a very long time. It's not as if, if that surface now. It just is that at the G20 meeting, because of the pandemic, uh, and in part because of uh, some issues of indebtedness which have been created uh, because of the BII, as in the case of Sri Lanka, for, for example, uh, this issue of uh, debt entrapment or, uh, or uh, the debt issues 
in order to facilitate uh, the growth of the developing countries is much more on the agenda uh, at this moment in the background, as I said, of the disruptions in global trade, the war in Ukraine, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not all as if uh, uh, the uh, reform of the multinational, multinational, multinational development banks, for instance. Uh, again, this is, this is something which is being pressed now. Uh, but in an indirectly, this has been on the agenda you know, for a long time when we've been uh, talking about a reform of the financial institution set up after 1945 with the World Bank and the IMF. So I'll conclude by saying that uh, uh, let's not read. Uh, there is geopolitics in all this, of course. There are interests or specific interests of countries involved, which will be promoted through what has been agreed or what, what is being pushed uh, on the G20 platform. But it is not uh, as if China is the centerpiece of, thing, uh, of all this. Thank you. I think there are two uh, uh, two answers, uh, two sides of uh, you know India's presidency. Uh, one is how it was physically organized. I mean, the G20 Leaders Summit in Delhi, uh, uh, because the world leaders and the delegations that have come have really seen a beautiful, uh, clean, made up, you know, uh, city, which was really very nice. It's not the first time for me to be in Delhi. I think it's fifth or sixth time. Um, so even for me, the kind of daily I've seen, I was really uh, positively impressed. Uh, of course, it comes with the constraints. It comes with uh, challenges. Um, and local residents have faced those challenges. So that is understandable. And that is what is happening across the world. Any city hosting such a major event would face the same challenges. So uh, I wouldn't, uh, you know, point that out or highlight it like we've seen in the Unfortunately, um, a lot of Western media outlets, be it uh, CNN or AP or, I don't know, uh, BBC, they have highlighted how, uh, you know, the government uh, has taken steps to cover the slums um, or enclaves uh, so that world leaders won't see. I mean, that is happening across the world. Each and every country is doing that. So I don't see how India is different from this. And I don't think India has ever uh, tried to cover up the kind of poverty problem it has. Uh, and uh, the West played its uh, significant role in, uh, you know, in this issue that India is struggling with. So um, this is very hypocritical of the, uh, you know, Western media to again and again uh, point it out and be silent on uh, lots of other things that ha India has done for the presidents and you know, and for the for the people in the past uh, decade, let's say. So that is one thing to it. Um, in terms of India's presidency, from the geopolitical point of view, which I think is more uh, important to our discussion, um, I think the effort that India has undertaken is uh, tremendous because um, India has brought uh, together and uh, successfully um uh, successfully um allowed the countries to reach the consensus uh, i think till the very last moment uh, people have been debating whether there will be a consensus whether there will be a, a declaration or it will be a chair statement or whatever it is so um the kind of document first that we had a document was an achievement and the kind of document i think it was surprising to all at least to all the media, um, because the kind of drafts that were discussed in some media reports uh, sent a very different message. And uh, the text that we finally got, uh, it was very difficult. It was very... Uh, so a lot of people say, uh, because I'm Russian, so I would start directly straightforward to Russia's position. Um, a lot of people were saying it's favoring Russia and China. But uh, I would uh, see it in a very much broader context. And in fact, it should be seen in a broader context. The, the G20 and the declaration is not about Russia and the West, right? It's about the world. It's a, it's, the G20 is a forum of global uh, world's biggest economies. So it caters to the world. It doesn't cater to the two at the moment conflicting blocks. 
So let's not uh, uh, sort of close down on that because that's a very limited view, limited scope. Uh, so the same thing, India's presidency shouldn't be seen in just bringing to the table these two conflicting blocks. That's a very limited understanding of it. Uh, the inclusion of uh, African Union in the G20, something that we have never seen. And India's outreach to um, you know Africa in the past uh, few years, especially in the recent past, uh, is tremendous. And I think the, um, as my colleague, um, uh, uh, the diplomatic editor of the Hindu, uh, Ms. Hassini Haider, uh, has pointed out, I was interviewing her, um, that this is a win for multilateralism. And uh, this is what is important because the world is so big, the uh, the developing countries, the, to, to give voice to the developing countries is uh, uh, very important because we, are, we have crossed the edge of globalization basically with the kind of internet technologies we have, any country, any nation uh, should have a voice. And the, the fact that it doesn't have just points out how unfair uh, this world, despite all the you know technological advances. Uh, so I think ending this uh, Western uh, or whatever, some people prefer the term global north, uh, dominance in everything, including the technology, uh, is very important because the potential, if you see the number of people in the global south, the potential is here. You know, it's in India, it's in Africa, it's in the entire South Asia uh, in terms of the number of people, in, term, in, in terms of number of young people, young population. Um, and uh, if uh, they get technology, if they get access to the markets, uh, they will, uh, you know, rule the world in the, in the coming future. So that's very important. That's a big achievement of India. And, uh, you know, I'm happy that uh, Indian government has really um undertaken such exercise you know if we if we reflect uh, on the last uh, uh, nine months and certainly you have another uh, india has another two months to go before it formally hands over uh, on the 1st of december to brazil i think uh, india has has really done an amazing job uh, of of chairing of presiding over the the g20 for a number of reasons i think one of the most interesting and I think innovative and very important uh, initiatives was that the entire Indian population should understand and be involved in, in the G20. And so for me, having visited over the course of the presidency this year, uh, uh, visited India three times uh, uh, for, for various engagements around the, the Think 20, I think what it was amazing to see Firstly, the prominence uh, across uh, across the a number of Indian cities that I visited, as well as the involvement of of many academics who would ordinarily not be engaged in uh, on G twenty issues, but also sort of people to people. So a really strong focus on 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 using it as an opportunity to familiarise and to to make people aware of of the diversity of of of. Uh, of the Indian subcontinent, so that I think, and, and making it, making it, um, trying to show to uh, to to the population the, the relevance of this uh, for for them, because sometimes you know these big summits can be quite um, uh, can can be quite disconnected. So that's the first point. The second one I think clearly relates to the uh, uh, the initiative taken by the Indian presidency very early on. In, in, in January, where it had the, the meeting of the summit of uh, Voices of the Global South. Uh, and, and again, I think very clearly wanting to put uh, the Global South at the top of its, its agenda, and particularly, of course, Africa. The third point was really pushing uh, for the African Union to become a, mem a permanent member of the, of the G20. This is not a new thing. Uh, the discussion around uh, African Union participation in the G20, and certainly the African Union has been an observer uh, at many summits. But I think taking the uh, making um, taking the decision to actually push forward uh, on this and putting it on the table and 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 taking that decision, I think, was another uh, indicator. And more broadly, I think 
India really engaging uh, on all of the of the touch points of the global challenges uh, that are not only facing the global south, indeed, but in fact the world the world as a whole. So I think. And, and doing so in in a in a rather difficult <laughs> geopolitical environment. And so I think uh, you know there there will always be you know comments about how things could have been done better. But I think certainly kudos to how it managed to navigate these terrains. I think very commendably. This time the feature of the G20 is uh, uh, came from the India's policy towards the global south. Uh, we can imagine the, what happened in the G20 summit in the past. Uh, that the G20 summit has started in 2008. Uh, that time, the Lehman shock has happened, and China invest much to save this situation. So that's why China's presence was very important in G20. So in the, every G20 summit, China show relatively strong presence and uh, advertise uh, their contribution to the world. But, uh, but this time, this time was uh, different. India and the global south leads uh, this G20. They push their opinion. They explain their op opinion to the world. And India will be the bridge. India is uh, was the bridge between the uh, global south and the G7. That's why China uh, downgrade their delegation, so Xi Jinping canceled to join because this is not China's G20. This is India's G20. This is global south G20, and India contributes the world. So this G20 was quite successful to a G20 because of this. This is not just advertisement assertive China. This is real G20, which includes the global South's opinion and uh, G7 side's uh, stance. India tried to be bridge and succeeded. So that's why this time, this is one kind of the ideal G20 and the turning point of the history of G20. That's uh, what I want to say as a first case. Great achievement. How do you view the unprecedented unanimous agreement on all 83 paras of the declaration, the absence of footnotes on chair summary and the substantial increase in the number of outcomes and annex documents in the declaration? Meet is usually reached when there is uh, a very minor issue that is of little interest uh, to most people. Uh, you know, I, I've been to India for uh, the past 25 years, at least twice a year, uh, with the exception of uh, maybe the uh, COVID years. And I've seen the great progress uh, of India over the years. And when I was in February, I was uh, in India, I visited Delhi, and some uh, of my many friends there, I was really surprised uh, to see uh, the great importance that relates uh, to, to the G20. Uh, you know, multilateral organizations uh, are not very important. And, uh, you know, uh, I can understand maybe some of the excitement. I can understand that uh, India has an election, uh, you know, next year it may help uh, uh, the ruling party, uh, but uh, the Chutenti is not, uh, you know, the the center of world politics. This is uh, a secondary institution. Uh, so uh, I think uh, whatever is being said there and decided, uh, you should always take it with a grain of salt. Uh, most important things are the bilateral issues and how actors act. Uh, uh, irrelevant of what uh, multilateral institutions are doing. Um, you asked about the strategic autonomy. I'm not sure what India means uh, by strategic autonomy, but if you, uh, if India wants to be a great power, uh, I think uh, the main measurement for being a great power 
is uh, the ability to project power uh, over distances. And um, obviously, uh, the Indian military has uh, acquired many abilities, capabilities in the recent years. Uh, but I think it still uh, has a, way, a, a long way to go, uh, particularly if uh, you know we compare it to the United States. Uh, I was very happy about uh, the G20 you know announcement uh, endorsed by President Biden of the corridor uh, to the Middle East and to Europe, which is basically uh, a version of the I2U2, in, in which Israel, of course, has a central role. Uh, because of our uh, strategic uh, uh, location. Uh, and uh, uh, as I see it, it's part of an American effort to bring India closer uh, to, the, to what's called the West uh, in its uh, rivalry with China, of course. And to some extent, uh, this is uh, some kind of alternative to BRI. Although, uh, uh, from what I read, uh, it will take 20 billion dollars to build this corridor, uh, and uh, I don't see the, uh, you know, the volunteers uh, to pay for it yet. Uh, so maybe, uh, you know, the Saudis will come up with the money, but uh, I'm not sure the Americans uh, will chip in uh, uh, seriously. So this uh, vision, which is important, uh, remains to, uh, to be realized. Um, you know, I... I I want to react to some of the, uh, you know, the Indian ambassador here about the role. I hope that India will be able to understand that getting involved in somebody else's conflicts is not a very healthy, you know, enterprise. So you know, I know there are countries that have a media mania. And uh, it's not helpful for their own foreign policy, and it's a waste of efforts. Usually, the uh, uh, the protagonists have to solve their own problems. Um, I want to make another comment, you know, about uh, BRICS and the CO. Any organization that includes Iran is an anti-Western organization. Any organization that includes a tyrannical and genocidal regime, like the one of the Ayatollahs in Tehran, uh, is obviously not friendly to Israel, is a problem for the United States, and I'm really sorry that India lent its vote to accept Iran to BRICS. Iran should be ostracized in the international community and uh, I'm not surprised, but I'm sorry that the international community does not act forcefully against such a regime. So, uh, and I hope India will be able uh, to think twice about its relations with Iran. Thank you for uh, for having me in this uh, conversation. Really interesting uh, so far. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that... Um, you know the fact that the Delhi Declaration uh, did uh, was produced is itself, I think, a symbolic victory, and that uh, there had been uh, a lot of doubt in the days leading up to the summit that there would not be any type of consensus at all, given just how sharp and intense um, geopolitical tensions within the G20 had become. Uh, I would argue much sharper than even last year when the Bali um, declaration came out. So I think it was even dif more difficult to get a consensus this year than last year. Um, and I think that also from the perspective of optics, had there not been a um, had there not been a consensus, had there not been a joint communique, I believe that would be the first time that that would have, have happened uh, with the G20 leaders summit. And that, that I think, uh, would not have been a good thing uh, for, for the G20 um, on, on the whole. Uh, one thing that stands out about the, Declar the Delhi Declaration is that it really does have India's imprint, uh, you know, and I think that's important. India being the the G20 uh, president and the host of this of this leaders summit, you know, reading through it, um, you know, a number of themes, a number of topics, a number of terms that I see 
you know, not an era of war in the section on Ukraine. Um, this focus on digital public infrastructure, which is a term that you don't hear that much, quite frankly, uh, here in the United States. I mean, that's clearly something, a contribution that India has made to this discourse within the G20. And in the climate change section, uh, you know, looking at this focus on uh, scaling up green hydrogen and green ammonia uh, capacities in the broader context of diversifying fledgling renewable mixes, you know, this is something that India has focused on in a big way as well, particularly announcing this new national strategy for green hydrogen. You don't hear as much about those clean fuels uh, here in the United States, for 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 uh, for example. So I think that's that's that really struck me too that this really obviously was a consensus document, but it also very much reflected the preferences and the priorities of, of India uh, as host. So I think that was significant. Uh, you know, I think we've already talked about it. The Ukraine section was predictably uh, modest. Uh, it was anodyne. It was watered down. But I don't, I don't agree with with this criticism that that suggests that it's some type of climb down from the Bali Declaration. When you had very sharp criticism of uh, of Russia and of the um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the goal here was a consensus, and I think the broader goal was to ensure the credibility and the integrity and legitimacy of the G20 itself. So the goal was to get a consensus. So that meant you know, you, you had to, to water things down and make concessions to all of the different members. And that happened. I think that, you know, the West got it, what, what it was looking for with this strong focus on how damaging the economic consequences of the war in Ukraine have been, uh, you know, for, for the world on the whole. And, uh, you know, certainly, you know, for, for India and, and like-minded, um, members, you know, this focus on the need for dialogue and discussion, not being an era of war, that's that that's clearly what what those countries wanted to see in this. And I think for, certainly with Russia and China, the fact that Russia was not mentioned at all in that section, that's the concession to Russia, right? Because Russia, I believe, had laid out a red line, which it had not done before the uh, the summit in Bali last year. It had laid out a red line this year, saying that it would not sign on to any document that was uh, that condemned the invasion or didn't reflect its position in some way. So that's what you had to do. Um, so I, I don't see this as a loss uh, or a bad thing uh, in the context of, of the G20's goals that you don't have this sharp criticism of the Russian invasion. Had that been the plan, you wouldn't have a consensus. You may not have a joint uh, communique, in in my view. So just a, you know, a few other um, comments that were sort of sparked by listening to the other uh, points. I think we need to keep in mind the broader geopolitical state of play here, not just within the G20 in terms of US, China, Russia, but also more broadly. I would argue that uh, the, this is a very critical moment for the G20. Um, we are seeing a an apparent um, inclination by the likes of China and Russia to try to expand efforts to develop forums and multilateral entities that could provide alternatives to the West. You know, BRICS expansion clearly is is is, is reflecting that expansion with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as well. And I think that that's not good um, for a number of reasons. One being that we are seeing that, the, in my view, the most pressing global challenges these days are borderless, you know, pandemics, climate change, and so on. I think this is not the time when you have you know, like-minded players or blocks retreating to their multilateral entities that they feel most co uh, most comfortable operating in. So in terms of China and Russia, the BRICS, SCO, the G7 for, for the U.S. and its its main Western allies. I mean, those, those entities are important, but the G20 is significant because it is meant to bridge those divides between West and non-West and Global South. And I think here, India deserves some more credit for, you know, emphasizing the importance of, of the needs of the Global South, bringing the African Union in. So I think that's why it's very important, it was very important for the G20 to succeed in this case, to ensure that you have this major entity that draws on the G7 countries, as well as many of the BRICS countries as well along with global south uh, nations so I'll, I'll i'll end there well we've heard a lot of different views uh, and interesting comments we compare ephraim's perspective with michael's on the significance of the g20 and their worlds apart uh, it, it, this like andrew i've been doing a lot of shows on indian tv in the past few days and the Indians are justly proud of their leadership role in the world at a time when there's no real leadership in the world. Uh, we got 
it got uh, Xi Jinping, you know, trying to want to make China great ag again and Putin making Russia great again and Biden making America great again. The fact that Modi, despite all his flaws, is trying to position himself as not just the voice of the global south, but the voice of the planet right now is really interesting and important. Now, India, you know, as uh, the foreign secretary said, India, this is the right timing for India. It's not only surpassed China as the world's biggest country, but its GDP grew 7% this past year. It had its moon landing and it's, it's maintained this kind of neutral position that allows it to play this role that other countries can't play. I mean, it didn't take sides during the Cold War, really. And, and now we see it positioned in a unique way. Yes, it gets, what, 85% of its arms from Russia. Yes, it gets cheap oil and gas from Russia. It has not gone a, with the U.S. position trying to uh, isolate or attack Russia over Ukraine and other, other issues. But it is the vo increasingly the voice for much of the global South in ways that other countries have not been. The reaching out to the African Union is a very important move in, in that regard. It's positions on energy and other issues. Uh, and the fact that it got unanimity on this, res this declaration, is it a great achievement? Now I look at it in part from the American perspective and I look at Biden and Biden's role. And Biden clearly went there with an agenda trying to more isolate Russia and China, especially in the absence of Xi Jinping and of Putin. I think it was a mistake for Xi Jinping not to be there from China's perspective. Uh, and, and Biden went there and saw this as an opportunity. But he realized that elevating India's role as a counterweight to China was more important than getting through his own interests on Ukraine. And the fact that the U.S. backed off of that, as did the Europeans, and was willing to accept this very watered down, as we say, anodyne uh, statement about Ukraine, maybe it was a good statesmanlike move on Biden's part for his broader goal, which right now is to elevate India's status. But we shouldn't lose sight of the, the the fact that Modi is, in the world's view, also a somewhat compromised figure. Uh, the recent Pew poll of the publics in twelve different countries said that showed that forty percent of the respondents said they did, did not have any faith in Modi's leadership or that Modi would do the right thing, and thirty seven percent said they did, and that's partly because of Modi's Hindu nationalism and the kind of ethnocentric politics that he's been associated with for more than, well, from throughout his career. And so he's trying to get above that and beyond that, but he's got to really address some of his own positions and his own rhetoric if he wants to play that kind of role for world leadership at a time when the world is desperately seeking somebody who's going to speak for the planet and not for his own local parochial interests. So I see this as a major victory for Modi and for India, uh, and, and in many ways, a victory for the world, uh, this summit. Uh, I agree with Michael that we need a body that is not narrowly ideological or committed to one side or the other, because we need to be solving these problems, energy, climate change, you know, the pandemics, war. These are global problems that we need global bodies that can address. The fact that next year it's going to be Brazil and Lula in charge of the G20 and then South Africa means that the world, the focus is shifting. And the more we shift away from the old geopolitics, uh, the better off the world is right now because we've got pro serious problems that we've got to address. My next question is to Miss Elizabeth and Mr. Satoru. 
what was the significance of the G20 summit's decision to admit the African Union as the permanent member? And what specific interests and priorities is the African Union likely to focus on as a full member of G20? And how might this impact global discussions on issues such as debt reduction, international financial reform, and climate funding? So, you know, many of us in, on the continent here in Africa have, have been arguing that a lot of the points, in fact, all of the points, that all of the agenda items that the G20 is discussing, um, uh, uh, particularly the ones obviously around global financial architecture, but also around the SDGs and so on, have a direct impact on Africa. So many of us on the continent have been arguing uh, for a long time that um, uh, that all of the items on the agenda of the G20 have a direct bearing and significant consequences for for Africa. And because of that, there needs to be an African voice at the table. Uh, let me give you an example. In the early years of the G20 as a summit, um, there was a lot of discussion about how we um, uh, reduce the risk of of, uh, uh, of of banks because of the banking crisis in the 2008, 2009, 2010. And some of the initiatives that were proposed would have dealt with the problems that the North faced, but would have in turn created problems for a continent like, like Africa, where some of the regulations and the initiatives uh, would in fact uh, make it much more difficult uh, uh, for people to, to bank and to be banked. South Africa has taken uh, the position uh, of uh, articulating some of the African concerns, but clearly having an African, the African Union at the table uh, means that there is a second African voice uh, on these issues. Clearly, now that the AU is a permanent member, uh, uh, from you know from 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 next year, I, I think there will be um, there is a lot that uh, Africa itself will need to sort of uh, prepare for uh, in order to be able to meaningfully engage because, of course, the AU Commission doesn't necessarily have infinite resources. It will need to build up a G20 unit uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to, to participate meaningfully in the various tracks both the Sherpa, the finance, all the working groups, and and, and so on. Uh, and, and here, the various institutions on the continent should be in a position to provide support to it. But critically, obviously, to come to, to your specific question about the kinds of uh, uh, topics that the AU and Africans more generally is going to be very keen on, uh, is first and foremost the issue of debt vulnerability, an issue that, of course, India has also put on the agenda uh, this year. Um, the, the G20 has engaged on it over, since 2020, but really the progress uh, in, in reducing debt of indebted countries has not been very good. Uh, so that is certainly something that uh, after the African Union will push. The other one is really around um, the multilateral development banks and being able to scale up funding Again, this was something that uh, Prime Minister Modi has also put on his agenda, interest uh, on the G20 agenda. But interestingly, also, I think a recognition from the US uh, that the World Bank has to scale up, that the US uh, and President Biden has indicated that he's certainly going to push to be able to allocate from the US more resources to the World Bank and see if other countries can also contribute to be able to increase the World Bank's lending capacity up to about by another 100 billion. So these are all very directly related to the the concerns that and the challenges that African uh, African countries face. There is also another dimension, for example, like uh, digital uh, infrastructure. Um, this has also been something that is, is, you know, India has been quite strong on. Um, we have a tremendous amount of innovation and startups and various parts of the continent, uh, but it is about making sure that this is channeled uh, uh, in a way that assists development and that it is also channeled in a way that doesn't create new inequalities. And I think that that's going to be a, a, a critical uh, issue. This time, uh, there are uh, some 
great achievement, but especially it's a uh, uh, Global South country faced a serious situation, and this, this D20 agreement tried to solve this uh, problem. That is the most important case. For example, the most serious case, uh, uh, many countries, all of the countries G20 agree is, uh, of course, the Ukraine issue, because this D20, including Russia and uh, G7, which is uh, fighting in the Ukraine now. But, but, uh, this is not the main point indeed. Of course, uh, in the Ukraine case, uh, in, because of the India's efforts, the India solved uh, this issue. That's why the both sides agreed. But at the same time, the Global South want to solve the issue is the uh, supply uh, line of the stable supply line of the food and the energy. Price is rising, and many governments in the world face the unstable situation. For example, in Africa, yes, because of the US Russia US China rivalry, when the coup has happened, so every time the, uh, G7 say Russia's Wagner should take the responsibility, and that is true. But at the same time, Background of the, this coup came from the price rise of energy and food resources. So view from the global south, yes, rivalry between US and Russia, US and China is important. But at the same time, the most important issue is they need food and energy. So in this G20, they agree how to supply more stable, uh, uh, stable pace. Uh, about uh, food and energy security. Uh, so um, they focusing on uh, the voice of Global South. That is the most important achievement India has done this time. Instead of the China, just the China's achieve, uh, advertisement of their presence, India show more practical and more important and more real Material based supply based uh, as a voice of the global south. India has advertisement this, and India uh, tried to suggest real slope. The all of G20 countries agree that is a great achievement. This is real voice of global south. And some dream has already included the economy, uh, new uh, economic development corridor between India to Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. That is also a good dream, but at the same time, but at the same time, the most important case the current the global South are facing is uh, supply line of the food and energy and uh, to try to prevent the price rise. Uh, that is uh, uh, GSM try to solve and uh, good uh, good framework as agreed. Ms. Elizabeth, if I could ask you a follow-up question on that. What does the African Union bring for the G20 on the table? I think the first point is that um, the fact that you have a continent which historically in the G20 has been underrepresented, um, you certainly create a, a G20 uh, which uh, has more input legitimacy you know, I mean, we can always argue that it's output legit. There is a, there is a degree of output legitimacy in some of its actions, but certainly that it, it is seen as a more legitimate body because it is more representative. Now, the G20 is never supposed to be 100% representative. That's the role of the UN. Um, but I think that's, that's the first point. The second point, I think, which is also very important is to, is that the participation of the AU will ho hopefully create more nuance and understanding of some of the critical division uh, or critical divisions uh, and the reasons behind them that we have seen in, in various uh, 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 forums over the last uh, uh, several years. This is not about an us and them. It is about recognizing that we're all much better off if we if we work and understand better the kinds of uh, of of, of uh, uh, initiatives, recommendations that we must take forward that include all 
of the developing world, including the most poverty stricken. And I think in, 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 in this regard, it's interesting to see the way in which the West uh, uh, sort of was, was really keen to have an outcome at the Delhi summit. They did not want the Ukraine war to be seen, uh, to be a stumbling block to having a declaration. Because I think they also realize that if they don't take to heart all of the points that the developing world and Africa have been raising systematically for many years, but which have now become much more focused and much more accelerated, they themselves stand to lose. Also in the geopolitical game. So it's it's a geopolitical dimension as well as, as just a developmental dimension. And I think... And from a global South perspective, clearly the the role uh, the the AU can add a, a another uh, sort of uh, add to the uh, to the strength of, uh, of 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 the global South in the G20, and hopefully create the opportunity for greater coordination uh, within the G20 among emerging economies. What was the significance of Xi Jinping's decision to stay away from the G20 summit? And how did it impact the dynamics of the summit? We haven't seen an official statement after the agreement on the consensus from China, except an article published by a think tank affiliated with the Chinese Ministry of State Security, which accused India of trying to take advantage of its role as the host of the G20 summit to promote its own agenda and harm Chinese interest. How do you value the situation? And this question is directed to Andrew K. P. Liu and uh, Ambassador Sibal pointed out uh, by our colleagues uh, on this panel, um, hidden uh, behind the agenda are a lot of uh, geopolitics. Uh, there is the perceived uh, rise of India, uh, and then the perceived um, uh, the United States using this as a platform uh, to counter China, uh, even without saying so. Uh, but then uh, on the two fronts, uh, as far as China, uh, India's leadership uh, of the global South, if not the whole world, is concerned. I think the most more important thing is not the rhetoric. I mean, you can write pages and pages of rhetoric, but then it boils down to the facts and the reality on the ground. Um, particularly, um, uh, India should look at itself domestically in terms of the um, efficiency of its infrastructure internally. How long does it take to trans? Trans, uh, transship uh, the goods from the east of India or the north of India to the south or to the other side. Mm -hmm. And then it's uh, a bureaucracy, even though it has been um, much improved. Um, and also the social inequalities, um, there are still the, the, in, the, 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 the have-nots uh, have been totally excluded even from sight um, uh, in, the, in Delhi these days during the uh, G20. Um, so I think that there, and also at the end of the day, it depends on the size of your economy and whether you are the, uh, the world's biggest trader, because trade means connectivity, and whether you're only trading on certain products, um, narrow products, and whether you are a powerful manufacturing powerhouse uh, or just relying on, on uh, some sort of uh, internal consumption uh, or, um, or even technologies. Um, and of course, the, the, uh, China envies um, the Indians' uh, entrepreneurial skills in the sense that most of the world's top you know, sort of uh, multinationals uh, are uh, have uh, the C chief executive officers are Indians, and no, not even one Chinese. But nevertheless, um, the, the, all it boils down to is the is the reality. Now, on the other side, uh, the United States. Oh, um, I, I need to mention the planet. Uh, as far as the planet is concerned, um, uh, of course, this is a great thing, um, uh, a rallying cry uh, for the world to pay attention to uh, climate change, uh, as a lot of developing countries are, are, are suffering. And not only developing countries, you can see typhoons, you know, sort of all over the place in Hong Kong, in dra a draft, and, um, um, and in, 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 in even developed countries. Um, but I think that rather than rhetoric, again, uh, it really depends on which one is the um, the global uh, green power. Um, and there is no doubt uh, that China produces most of the world's uh, green um, uh, renewable energy in terms of solar power, in terms of hydropower, in terms of wind power. And above all, the, um, the what we're seeing 
is the uh, um, uh, a revolution uh, in the car industry, a revolution towards electric uh, vehicles. And there is no uh, no price guessing, which is going to be the next Detroit uh, for electric cars. They're all in China. So I think that China is not making a, a drum, um, a song and dance about it. Uh, nor should India. I think that um, the, the, the thing, the, everything boils down to what are on the ground. Now, as far as the United States is concerned, uh, it seems to be scoring a point, uh, pointing to the global south and to the rest of the world that there are alternatives. As I pointed out, that the um, the so called uh, India, Middle East, and Europe uh, is only one single um, link. Uh, where is the um, uh, the Baron Row? Uh, up to now, is already uh, investing um, um, a trillion US dollars. Of course, there are problems, um, and China's learning uh, um, uh, as it goes along. But the fact remains that forty million uh, people um, along the Baron Row have been lifted out of poverty because of this infrastructural. Um, uh, the remedy of the infrastructural shortages. Now the Difference is that the China's model um, doesn't concentrate on commercially viable projects only. And here is the rub uh, for the um, um, the partnership for infrastructure uh, and investment, uh, the PFII promoted by the United States, because that relies on a great deal of, of commercial uh, interest. Uh, whereas the, the projects along the China's Belt and Road uh, include schools, hospitals, uh, and also some um, hi some highways uh, and some uh, and a lot of uh, 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 ports, for example, building ports. Not all of these are commercially attractive. So here is a, the rub. Uh, rather than a, a triumphalism that okay, well, the Bern Road is finished, it's going down the tube, and we have the PFII, we have this link. Um, I think it always boils down to the reality. And above all, in the um, the, the communique, there is a subtle pointer. Uh, to unilateralism. Uh, for example, there's a phrase, carefully inserted, no doubt, after a great deal of uh, diplomatic uh, wrangling, uh, that all countries should abide by the United Nations Charter. Uh, now, here is the important phrase, in its entirety. So it is a, a not so subtle um, um, a kind of uh, nod uh, towards uh, cherry picking. Uh, by some countries, where it suits some countries to invade other countries, uh, it's not um, it, it's not exactly a binding by the U.S. Charter, but it also, um, of course, it, it also rubs the other way uh, on uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, whereas, of course, uh, I think that China played a, a quite a significant role in inserting this phrase in its entirety, because, uh, for example, on Taiwan, Taiwan is recognized is not recognized by the United Nations as a separate country. Uh, and yet some countries are trying to play it both ways. So I think that uh, there is a great deal of geopolitics hidden uh, in the statement, uh, but then that's the reality we're facing. Um, I think that uh, it's quite instructive that President Xi highlighted flag up two initiatives. One is the Global Security Initiative. Uh, in other words, you just can't rely on your own sense of security. You have to take into account uh, your counterpart's own national security. Otherwise, the whole world will always be at odds. And also the other initiative is the Global Development Initiative. Uh, again, very inclusive. Now, it's easier said than done. Even China is, is, is not entirely unselfish. You see, no country is unselfish. I mean, that, that's the nature of, of geopolitics. First of all, we are almost arguing that uh, uh, China was not present at the G20 at all. In fact, the Chinese prime minister was there, uh, and he's not a nobody. And he's the one who actually also represented China in the East Asia summit. So China is very much part of this uh, cons consensus uh, statement, and all the hidden geopolitics in it, and all that is being uh, added. All that has been mentioned as pointed at China, you know, all that was accepted by China. Now, if China had very strong views about this and felt that uh, this was not acceptable, uh, that they could have either blocked these, these references or modified them in a way that did not, in their view, target China, but that didn't happen. Uh, so I think they, one needs to keep this in mind, that uh, one shouldn't uh, assume that this has been done under, 
uh, on the back of China. China is very much part of of uh, the G20 leaders uh, leadership dec leaders declaration. That's one. Uh, the other is that uh, uh, no, there is no desire on anybody's part uh, to cancel China. Uh, or, or to isolate China economically, uh, or deal with China in the way that the West is dealing uh, with Russia. Um, it is a fact that China uh, has grown remarkably in the last few decades and has become what it is today, uh, the biggest exporter in the world, the second largest uh, economy. And uh, as was mentioned quite rightly, it has uh, developed certain technologies and certain capacities in which they are leading, whether it is the solar panels and or the critical elements that are required <clears throat> in the electrical vehicles and all that. But you know, one shouldn't also, the Chinese uh, shouldn't begin to believe that they've always uh, been where they are today. They, they began at a certain level, and of course, very commendable, they put in a lot of effort and they have reached where they are today. It's not as if China was never poor. Or if China didn't have the kind of problem that India is facing, it has a different system. It has been able to overcome that. But they also forget that it has largely been on the back of back of all that they got from the West. Without the kind of support they got from the West, China would not have been where it is today. Even today, look at Germany. They are willing to break ranks with the U.S. because you know they made so much money in China and they're so much involved in China. They don't want to break away from it. The third thing. It's not as if uh, it is in G20 that uh, there is this feeling about uh, uh, promoting projects uh, which may be directed at uh, uh, China's uh, grip over uh, infrastructure development globally and this and that. You know, in fact, it's after the pandemic, as a result of the pandemic, as a result of uh, the grip that China has acquired over certain critical technologies, that the whole idea of decoupling began of, uh, you know, uh, finding alternative supply chains, more reliable, more trustworthy uh, supply chains. Now, of course, the United States has walked back from the phrase of decoupling, they're talking of de-risking. But even de-risking, what does it mean, actually? They don't want to put all their eggs in the Chinese basket. They want to have alternative uh, geographies uh, from, from where they can uh, get the kind of manufacturing that they want or engage in cooperative ventures to set up manufacturing capabilities there with the help of U.S. and Western capital so that the supply lines are more reassured, more reassuring. And that is where India comes in. We are trying to see if we can draw these uh, uh, supply chains uh, to the extent that the Western multinationals want to move away from China to come to India so far, they prefer to go to Vietnam and some to Bangladesh or what have you. Uh, so we will reach a certain degree of development in course of time. It might be slower than what China has achieved, but China shouldn't have the sense of hubris uh, as if they were always where they are today. They were not. So if India is today, in terms of inequality, China is actually more inequality as a society than in the case of India. The statistics are there. Uh, finally, uh, I think I, I, I agree with many of the points that have earlier been made about uh, the West uh, desire to preserve the G20 as a platform, uh, because otherwise they clear the ground for alternative platforms like the BRICS and uh, the uh, SEO to grow, in which the West is not present, and therefore the West will not be able to dictate the agenda. This way, they have a group in which major developing countries are, are present, the Global South is present, and therefore they can have a more, uh, how should I say, uh, broad-based agenda which takes into the interests of everyone, and, and, the defense, and the West will be able to preserve its longer-term interests uh, by uh, having a say in shaping uh, that agenda and controlling uh, the pressures that are coming from the rest in terms of uh, changing the basis of global uh, governance. Uh, therefore, I think uh, the West has been uh, constructive uh, in this uh, G20 meeting. And finally, a couple of points. One is that uh, 
you know, unless unless the basic uh, uh, conflict between the United States and Europe on one side and China and Russia on the other side is not resolved or is not contained, then anything that G20 does or any other anything else is done on the global platform will not succeed. Because at the end of the day, in terms of implementation, you need the support of every power, every, every big country in the world. And if it is blocked in the United Nations system, it's not as if the G20 can operate separately from the UN system and work more efficiently. The same divisions, the same confrontation will come into this. Uh, and that is going to be a long haul. I don't think that this is uh, for tomorrow, that the G7 plus uh, will be able to resolve its widening differences with Russia and China. The Ukraine conflict is also likely to endure for uh, some time for the foreseeable future and continue to uh, put a lot of pressure on international cooperation in various ways. Even if the, the uh, declaration had paragraphs on Ukraine, which are softer than in the case of Bali, and Russia was not mentioned, doesn't mean there's going to be any fundamental change in U.S. and European policy towards Russia. Secretary of State Blinken has already said yesterday or the day before that they're not going to tell uh, Ukraine uh, not to use long-range weapons against Russian territory. That is up to them to decide, et cetera, et cetera. And they'll continue to give them arms and give them other financial support. They're not going to be de deterred by the fact that uh, there are paragraphs in, uh, in the G20 declaration uh, which are more conciliatory relatively towards uh, towards Russia. Uh, and, in, and the last point about Iran that was mentioned by our Israeli, uh, by the Israeli panelist. Now, on the one hand, he said that uh, countries should not get co caught in other people's quarrels. And this is the point he made. <laughs> so why does he want India to get involved in the quarrel between Israel and Iran? I mean, it's the same logic. Uh, our relationship with Israel has developed extremely well. It's, it, it is solid now. But we have very clear ge geopolitical interests in Iran. The United States put a lot of pressure on us in the past uh, on Iran, especially du during the nuclear deal negotiations. And even now, um, there are pressures that continue. But um, it's not as if the will and preferences of the United States or Israel have to determine Indian foreign policy. Just as Israel has its own independent foreign policy interests, India too has. But we, are, we do not do anything which will in any way harm either Israeli interests or U U.S. interests. And just as we expect Israel and the United States not to do anything to harm our interests, uh, whether it be Russia or Iran or any other part of the world, so I, I think one should sort of make easy judgments and facile uh, judgments on uh, on issues that uh, are very difficult when it comes when it comes to managing uh, foreign policy in a fragmented world. In a fragmented world, thank you. You know the discussion I hear is a bit naive because you cannot really escape geopolitics. You cannot escape the security dilemma. And uh, because we are human beings and we are uh, motivated by fear, as two citizens uh, has clearly pointed out. So we cannot talk about, you know, harmony and all those things to do good for the planet. Those, those are, you know, slogans. You have to look as it was pointed out uh, by <laughs> our Chinese uh, panelists, you know, to, to reality. And there, there is a reality. And, you know, if India, for example, wants to play a global role, and I say it as a friend, uh, you have to decide whether you want to be the head of the non-alignment movement or, you know, the equivalent of today, the global south, which is basically weak actors, you know, a collection of weak actors, or you want to play uh, in the big boys' league. And, of course, there are consequences to, to the Indian choice. You know, uh, glorifying the G20 
I'm not sure is the road to become a global power. That's my, you know, uh, humble conviction. Um, and um, of course, as a friend of India, I say it openly, and Israelis have a reputation for being uh, oh, very open, very frank, uh, maybe more than so. So uh, that's a, a clear question the Indian foreign policy has to face. About uh, Iran, Iran is not a usual country. Iran is a country that behaves uh, in an extremely radical way. I don't think there are many countries that uh, have a goal to uh, destroy another country. This is very unusual. And uh, despite the fact that I understand that normative considerations are not on the top of the agenda of foreign policy makers. But in our case, this is an existential threat. It's a security, it's a national security threat. So it affects a very important, you know, national interest. It's not just, it's not a nice country or it has some kind of uh, territorial conflict with another country, and there are many like this. This is a country that says openly, boasts about it, that Israel should be erased. And therefore, I think it needs separate treatment uh, in the international arena, particularly from India, that both to have a normative aspect to its foreign policy. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, without these pretensions, Maybe I will be less harsh on this issue than here. <laughs> what are the key objectives and potential impacts of the India Middle East Europe economic corridor? And how does it compare to the China's Belt and Road Initiative? And what role does Israel play in this? India has clear interests in particularly in the Gulf. It's a source of, uh, of its energy. It has a big diaspora there. That, uh, uh, transfers, remits a lot of uh, funds uh, to India. Uh, India uh, obviously uh, would like to uh, probably uh, to establish some kind of alternative to the BRI uh, and uh, um, it hopes that uh, it will attract uh, more support from the United States. So this is the main interest, and maybe it would like to play a greater role as the Americans are retreating from the Middle East, or at least lowering their interest in the Middle East. As far as Israel is concerned, uh, we really have a great interest in such a corridor because it will strengthen the Abraham Accords that uh, were signed in 2020. And uh, will uh, be able will be able to take advantage of this corridor to improve relations uh, with uh, with the Abraham Accords countries. And at the same time, uh, we shouldn't forget Israel is uh, has an important alignment with the Hellenic world, with Greece and Cyprus. Uh, so, uh, uh, in this respect, Israel being uh, in the middle and uh, able to help also uh, the Hellenic uh, partners uh, is, uh, gives uh, Israel an additional leverage in this uh, alignment. Uh, India for Israel is of course a very important country. Uh, we, uh, since the uh, mid nineties, uh, we built a very good relationship with uh, India. Uh, personally, I was part of it. And I am very proud of, of my uh, Indian connections. Uh, India for Israel is a huge market uh, in, in the civilian area, in, uh, of course, also in the military area. Uh, we are partners in many uh, projects. Uh, India uh, is uh, a country that uh, has not been beleaguered by anti-Semitism. Uh, because it's not part of the biblical culture. So uh, connecting India to Europe uh, via 
the Gulf and, uh, and uh, the Hellenic countries is something that serves very well uh, Israeli uh, interests and will be happy to be part of it. And this project is basically uh, uh, based upon the idea that was aired initially by Indians, the I2U2, uh, which the Americans adopted. And we'll see how much they are committed uh, my next question is for Ambassador Al Yamani, Mr. Ifrahim, and Mr. Sudoru. In what ways does the IMEC contribute to regional and global economic integration? And what are the geopolitical implications of the IMEC, particularly in terms of India's strategic engagement with the Arabian Peninsula and its potential to reduce political tension in the Middle East? The corridor or, or other the economic related agreement is in indirect link with, uh, of course, India China competition. And uh, this is also in indirect link with the US China competition. In the long run, how to get support from the global south is a very important issue because this issue will be the decisive factor. Which side will win? Last three competitions, when we check, World War I, World War II, or US Soviet Cold War, every time bigger group won the competition. For example, the World War I, 32 countries, the winner side. Four countries is the loser side. World War II, the uh, 54 countries, consists the winner side, and eight countries consist the loser side, including Japan. And the US Soviet Cold War, 64, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, 54 versus 26. So every time bigger group won the competition. So if we talk about US China competition, India China competition, Japan China competition, or Europe and or Western country versus China competition, China Russia in this case, in this case, they need to persuade the many countries, including many global South countries. That's why the care about uh, opinion, voice of the global South is very important matter. This will be the historical because of this is decisive factor to uh, be, uh, be the winner of the competition. So that is real, uh, so really happen. So view from the Europe, yes, this corridor is a very important uh, uh, supply line of the energy and the trade route is also included. At the same time, influence towards Africa is uh, affected. And uh, Including Africa, uh, of course, uh, I need to reply. Uh, African Union has included, uh, because uh, this is very important, including 50, uh, more than 50 countries is consist in the African Union. And uh, this means that when we talk about the competition, how to get a bigger number, this is uh, rely on the uh, many regions, including Africa. And Africa consists of more than 50 countries. Mm -hmm. In case of Morocco, a little ambiguity. So how many, the not, uh, I cannot say exactly. That's why the more than 50 are used. But uh, uh, that's why, that's why uh, India, including Africa Union this time, is very important achievement. From Africa, the G7 include only South Africa. That is not enough. So before the G7, before G20, they talk about how to include Nigeria. But Nigeria and South Africa is not enough. Finally, the, uh, in, uh, many countries, including India, agreed. So now Africa Union. Africa Union means that uh, try to include the voice of all of Africa. So that is the uh, important issue to get uh, bigger support from the global south and the bigger support from the world to win the competition. So for the India, for the United States, for the Europe, for Japan, uh, all of these, this is historical because G20 is 
real representative of global south with G7. And India lead this bridge. That is a very important. It's a question because the IMEC is, is a huge initiative. Of course, it's not like the, the BRI, um, but uh, uh, as the BRI is including 139 countries, uh, and and uh, this project is is uh, much smaller, but in a strategic uh, approach is more important than the the built and road uh, initiative, because it connects uh, India uh, through the Middle East to Europe, and it includes like uh, 53 countries uh, in in total. That with the with around um, with the trade balance of around. We we expect that the trade balance will will go into nine trillion uh, in the in the in the once this this process this project is established. Um, uh, when it comes to when it comes to the to the infrastructure, I think that the Middle East is ready uh, because we have uh, the Jabal Ali uh, infrastructure in in United Arab Emirates. And we the the railroad will be established, and 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 um, and Europe. It's it's easy, but we are still still waiting. Within maybe two months, we will see the the real project and the real budget. And uh, of course, Saudi Arabia has announced already the contribution of twenty billion uh, uh, initial investment on on in this project. And uh, and um, we still need to see the the concrete proposal uh, within 60 days as as it was envisaged in the in the in the agreement of or the memo of understanding so uh, it's very important for 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 india and the middle east to renew its, its historical ties as the trade partners it's it's for for india and the middle east for example if you go to the to the beginning of last century, you see that everything uh, uh, we were using and consuming was coming from India. And uh, I think it's very important that we, we rectify a big mistake that we made with the concept of globalization when the West decided that China was the best place to uh, to reallocate all its industries and all its technologies and it contributed to the to the, the huge development and uh, technological advances of china but uh, with the new initiatives and the the strategic approach and the strategic partnership between the united states and india that was um uh, i mean uh, it was achieved during the visit of uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi to to Washington a few months ago. Uh, it shows that uh, the West decided that um, the Indian economy, uh, the potential uh, partnership of the West with the, with the, with in the, when it comes to the supply chain and the technological ad advances, will be properly addressed and reallocated to India. And this is very important, but also there is there is few challenges and in 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 the relations of the Middle Eastern countries, the GCC countries, and India. Uh, it's also the all these clashes between between the racial racial clashes and, and issues of human rights. Although we don't raise these issues in, we don't consider them as Western countries when we address it in every meeting. But the Indian government understand this situation that uh, India of Jawaharlal Nehru and India of uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, should always remain the India that unites all Indians. Uh, when, I, when I'm talking about India that reflects the interests of Indians, I'm, I'm talking about the Hindu community and um, the Christian community and the uh, uh, and the Sikh community and the Muslim community to live uh, uh, in, in a nation that is hugely moving to be uh, the third biggest economy in the world. And, and, and it's very important for, for Indian to understand that our partnership uh, is strengthening and our partnership is growing and, uh, and, 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 and we are working hard to get 
more, if you see, for example, the outcome of the two days ago, the, the meeting of uh, MBS, uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, with the, in the in the bilateral negotiation with with the Prime Minister Modi, uh, you see that uh, Saudi Arabia pledged 100 billion uh, injected one well, is is ready to inject 100 billion into the Indian economy. It includes the the, the refinery and and other other, other major major uh, projects in India. So it's our our bilateral relations in the in the Middle East and GCC area uh, with India is huge and 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 it's growing. In the aftermath of the G20 summit, it's evident that the final declaration stopped short of explicitly condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine, leading to mixed reactions. While Russia held the summit as unconditional success. Ukraine expressed disappointment and the United States highlighted the significance of the joint statement. How do you assess the G20's stance on the Ukraine conflict and its potential impact on global geopolitics and crises, particularly considering the challenges in reaching a consensus on language to address Russia's role in the conflict? I was personally surprised and uh, I know a lot of uh, media colleagues who were surprised to see the kind of text that we have seen. Uh, definitely I studied the entire uh, geopolitical part of it around eight, seven or eight points and I was going line by line uh, and comparing it with the Bali declaration. Mm, so what ha what is missing from uh, Delhi declaration is reference to Russia's war against Ukraine. So Russia is missing, against is missing. Uh, Ukraine war is mentioned as that, just as Ukraine war. This is first surprising thing. Then Bali Declaration uh, demands withdrawal, uh, unconditional withdrawal of troops from Ukraine. That point is completely missing. Even suffering of people uh, exists in um, Delhi Declaration, but in totally, um, in a different para. Uh, so the big take away from the Delhi Declaration is that Ukraine conflict is just one of the ongoing conflicts. People are dying across the world, see what's happening in Africa. Uh, if you read news reports, I mean, because I'm following Ukraine conflict, for the past one and a half years, since its very beginning, I've reported from the war zone. So for me, uh, numbers, how many people die today and tomorrow, these are not just numbers, okay? I've seen people dying and uh, these are lives. Uh, so when you read the reports from elsewhere, uh, from other conflicts, especially right now in Africa, uh, there are scores, there are dozens of people that, uh, you know, dying or being hurt every day. So uh, hij hijacking the agenda with just, um, you know, uh, portraying Ukraine conflict as a global conflict uh, is not right. And uh, um, we should condemn the media for doing that because then people don't get information or, you know, understanding um, what's happening elsewhere, that people are suffering elsewhere. So what the Delhi Declaration did, it actually um, combined, it said that, um, conflicts around the world bring human suffering, which is true. Uh, and that nations should work to prevent and should uh, follow the, you know, UN uh, rules to prevent these conflicts from happening. So it's not just about Ukraine, it's about each and every conflict that is happening. Um, so, and that's why Russia war is missing because uh, if we see what the Western country, countries, particularly the U.S., has been doing across the world and has been invading. We had Iraq, we had Syria, we had a number of conflicts. Uh, and where is the responsibility? Now, um, I've asked during the press conference of uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, I've asked the question, actually I've asked this question to the Indian presidency as well uh, during the first day of uh, the summit they had addressed the media and I was the very same question uh, they sort of didn't respond to it um, and even the <laughs> Russian foreign minister didn't directly re responded to it uh, the question was 
um, do G20 countries discuss um, the responsibility of uh, powerful and rich nations who impose the sanctions that later impact the food um, supplies, the global supply chains, basically, they get disrupted. And, um, you know, goods, including food, they just don't reach the poorer countries who have nothing to do with any of these conflicts, right? So, uh, as uh, Mr. Lavrov said, that uh, these issues apparently are discussed. Uh, we will, may not find uh, the mentioning of the word sanctions in the declaration, but since it's a, a you know diplomatic document, uh, the wording is different. But as he also mentioned, uh, those who understand, they will understand. You know, so uh, importantly, he said that the uh, Western countries or the the you know uh, developed nations won't get away with what they are doing. So somehow, um, I, I'm not a diplomat or a lawyer uh, to uh, assess um, the actual wording of the declaration, but I can only refer to what he has stated. Um, if that has been discussed, if that is in the text, that is a great achievement. The other question is who, how the countries will follow what is written in the declaration, how they will implement, will they change their policies? So this is something, of course, we will have to see. And I don't think anyone has any illusions and will expect, you know, tremendous changes on the ground, as we can see that there is no change in the grain deal issue. It is where it is. Uh, Russia has uh, initially put out some conditions that have never been met. And even after it withdrew from the deal after one year, uh, till today, everyone wants the deal back, but nobody wants to uh, fulfill those conditions. So, I mean, that's uh, that's how it is. Well, I think I, I already covered this a bit uh, earlier, uh, that uh, pretty much every member got uh, what it what I, Well, I shouldn't say every member got what it wanted, but every member uh, received a, a consent, a, a concession, right? Yes, the US and uh, its Western allies in the uh, in the G20 would have preferred more would have preferred a condemnation. Um, but uh, if you're if, if that was going to appear in the declaration, there wouldn't be a declaration because Russia would have uh, would have uh, rejected that. So, you know, as I said before, you know, I think that um uh you know these the us and like-minded members were appeased by the 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 language that talked about the damaging uh uh global economic impacts of the of the war and i think that the references to un principles against uh are emphasizing territorial integrity and and, and all of that uh, that was that was that was the way to appease the us and the west and then the other the other comments about um, or the other language in this section about um, the need to end the war. That's what India and its like minded members wanted to see. And Russia and China were, I think, happy, given that Russia wasn't mentioned at all in this section. So I can completely understand that many would uh, would criticize this as something that's insufficient and watered down and, you know, basically lets uh, Russia get away with uh, something, so to speak. But again, the goal here was not to privilege any one member's views over the other on this very broad issue. It was to get a consensus uh, in the interest of the G20 and uh, and and its success. So I think that that's 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 the clear uh, for me. That's the main um, takeaway. Um, you know, just a few other very brief closing thoughts. Again, responding to what we heard from uh, from other panelists. I think you know, there's been a lot of talk about this infrastructure, this new monster infrastructure project, the U.S., Europe, Middle East, um, U.S. infrastructure project. And there's been, I would argue, a lot of reflexive criticism of it in which basically the view is this is completely unrealistic. How could you have any type of project like this, given the economics and the geopolitics of it? And I think one problem here is that we really don't know a lot about what this project entails, right? There was a there was a um, an MOU that uh, the the members of this new project put out. There hasn't been much information about it. However, we have seen in the days since the deal was announced some very peculiar maps posted on social media 
uh, that appear to depict the this this corridor project, and it suggests that you're that a port in Greece, the Pyrus uh, port in Greece, will be used as a major um, way station, uh, a, a big sort of linchpin for this project in Europe. And then you're going to have trade, and and you're going to have corridors, railroads, shipping lanes, and so on, connecting uh, Europe to the Middle East and and India. I did not hear in any of the uh, the official statements about this project, anything about Greece, for example. And many have pointed out that that port that appears in this map is actually uh, owned by a Chinese company at the moment. There's, there's a Chinese company has has some type of interest in it. So I think it's important for us, and it's hard in this day and age when you know, I think so many commentators, including myself, I admit, sometimes are tempted to offer very initial analysis when you still don't have a lot of information about any one thing. So I think this infrastructure project is one thing that we need to sort of wait to to hear a bit more information about what it really is about. But what I would say about this, you know, there's been a debate about whether this is meant to counter China or not. Um, you know, I think that from a U.S. perspective, it certainly is meant to present alternatives to Chinese models of investment through BRI. And indeed, uh, the U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor, John Finer, and some on the record comments, I think that he made in New Delhi, or he, he made during the G20 summit, you know, he, he pitched it as something that would entail inclusive, um, equitable, non-coercive type investments. That's a clear, explicit contrast with China and what the U.S. feels to characterize the BRI uh, investment model. But certainly, I, I would uh, certainly many of the other uh, participants in this project would not want this to be projected as as something meant to counter China, given that the you know, the Saudis and the UAE, Israel, if it were to play a part of this, and indeed some European countries. Um, have their own important commercial relations with China, and some of them participate in in BRI. But um, I, my my main uh, caution here is that we be careful to to weigh in heavily on this new project until we have a bit more information about what it really entails. But I think Michael did a good job of explaining the politics behind this watered down resolution when it comes to Russia and Ukraine. But in the broader context. We have to understand that in light of the Ukrainian counteroffensive and the fact that it is not succeeding, or if it's succeeding, the success is so slow and incremental <clears throat> that it's not going to achieve its real purposes. And yet the United States uh, keeps saying our support for Ukraine is unlimited and keeps offering more and more arms, more and more money and doing what he can to prolong the conflict. The goals on both sides are unrealistic. Russia is not going to achieve what it intended initially in Ukraine. And Ukrainians are not going to drive Russia out of every inch of Ukrainian territory. So the position that much of the global South has taken, and India and other countries, is to not choose sides, but to push for peace. India's peace plan is, I mean, China's peace plan is really quite interesting because the first, the 12 point peace plan, the first point set, condemns, uh, supports sovereignty, effectively criticizing Russia for infringing Ukrainian sovereignty. But the second point says that no nation's national security should be achieved at the expense of other nations' national security, which was a direct criticism of NATO and NATO expansion. But I think most of the world sees what a you know what a what a that this is we've reached the point now with hundreds of thousands of people dead and wounded and injured, and we're looking at another year now of more of the same. We're going to be back here at the same point a year from now with a half million more people dead and injured and neither country having a decisive victory. So the pressure is to move toward some kind of diplomatic off-ramp. Uh, and diplomacy is important, especially uh, the, um, uh, Mr. Sabal said that no country has a desire to cancel China. Well, maybe that's true because nobody can cancel China, but there certainly is a desire, as Xi Jinping said, to contain, to limit, to surround, to encircle China. Now, now, what I'm concerned about is the militarization of the Pacific. 
and and that is clearly U.S. policy. When Obama announced the his Asia pivot, and Hillary Clinton did back in 2011, it wasn't able to get it really started in a serious way till the Trump administration. But now Biden came to office with 18 top advisors from the Center for New American Security. And these are the China Hawks. This is the Sullivans and the Campbells and the Ratners and the others. And they have a clear agenda. And their policy, as we've seen, is the militarization. Now, and even India has become part of that with the Quad. But we also see AUKUS. We see the Yoon government in South Korea. We see Japan doubling its defense spending. We see four new bases in the Philippines. Uh, General Minihan, Army General Minihan, said recently he thinks the U.S. and China will be at war by 2025. We've heard that sentiment from other U.S. military leaders. And so I think that we might not have plans to cancel China, but there's certainly uh, an effort underway. Uh, and, and the G20, the U.S. effort at the G20 was part of this to polarize, to not to unite the world in the way that some of us have been talking about, and that Ephraim thinks is uh, a lot of rhetoric, but to uh, to actually further polarize the world. And and I think to the extent that G20 is something positive, and Modi's vision is something positive, is the way in which it counters that kind of vision. And the G20 and the consensus that it reached is effectively a statement of countering that vision. But there, we ha- should recognize that there are malign forces, not only in Iran, uh, but in other parts of the world that are looking for that kind of polarization. Uh, and and I think those forces need to be countered. The recent G20 summit in New Delhi featured discussions on global challenges like food and energy insecurity, with an emphasis on fighting poverty. However, there seems to be a notable absence of specific language addressing Russia's role in aggravating these issues, particularly through its actions in Ukraine. How do you interpret this omission in the G20 declaration and what do you believe it signifies for addressing the broader global challenges? Ms. Senya, could you please share your opinions about this? All this is very simple. Um, the um, West has been trying to blame Russia on uh, inflicting the uh, sufferings on, on the, let's say, African countries or uh, some of the Southeast Asian countries who do not get um, the grain or other um, uh, other supplies uh, but uh, they don't get it uh, because of the shipping problems, uh, because of the um, uh, payment transaction problems, and not because they're the the physically the grain is not there physically it is there, and even Ukraine has been um, exporting it. It it is doing it even now through other routes uh, rather than the Black Sea route that was there. So. Uh, their their statements don't match with reality. What is important is that uh, while imposing the sanctions, um, they the these sanctions they affect uh, normal people. They affect small time businesses. Uh, let's say uh, if Russia or if any other country was doing business with Russia, uh, be it small time trade, uh, you can trade. Uh, tea, coffee, garments, you can trade anything, right? And then uh, Russia is completely cut off from the financial system. So uh, the, the payments are not going. So it, it affects so all the small businesses that have no say in all these big, uh, you know, geopolitical uh, gatherings, right? Uh, so at the same time, sanctions is not something that uh, has been a UN instrument. Uh, United Nations instrument, right? These are that's why they're called unilateral sanctions, because we always uh, there is a U.S. sanctions list, uh, there is a European Union sanctions list. There is nothing like U.N. sanctions in terms of the Ukraine conflict, right? Um, so, uh, using sanctions as uh, basically as a tool of uh, war, we can say. 
that's what at least that's how Russia's uh, official position uh, stands that uh, using the sanctions uh, is equal to you know supplying weapons uh, to to Ukraine it's just one of the tools uh, and um, uh, it's it's uh, uh, see Ukraine conflict is a very complex conflict and it didn't start in uh, 2022 it has started much much before and it was the uh, Kiev government that has started bombing uh, their own citizens. I've spoken to the citizens myself, so I I have no, uh, you know, I'm I'm not shy to uh, present their point of view. That's what they have told me. Um, so the conflict started much much uh, earlier, and uh, I don't think the entire world has really uh, understood that part because uh, uh, as much as the global economy uh, depends on or impacted by let's say dollar and euro n- that much uh, the um, uh, media is impacted by english language uh, you know we- western dominated uh, reporting so that side of the story is never uh, articulated even though uh, before uh, february 2022, they were going, the Western outlets were going to those places and were reporting on Donbass conflict as a conflict between, uh, you know, Ukraine and its own, uh, their own citizens. But somehow those reports are not to be remembered anymore. So Ambassador Al-Yamani, one of the highlights of the G20 summit was India's initiative to launch the Global Biofuels Alliance, which aims to boost biofuel production and trade. How does this alliance align with India's broader goals of addressing global energy and climate challenges, especially in the context of reducing dependence on fossil fuels like coal? It's an important initiative for the South. And you know that India is is a leader in in this initiative with Brazil and and with the United States that they created this initiative and and it's it's really very very important and, and vital for for our economies in the south where we have agriculture and we can use biofuel uh, m- more and more in uh, to 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 counterbalance the the use of uh, of uh, the fossil uh, fuels and and that's why we we consider that this initiative maybe it's not it's not that important for countries with 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 less uh, less agricultural uh, i mean uh, in, in 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 industries but but it's very important for countries uh, like brazil and and and, 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 and and india and countries in africa and uh, and also countries in the middle east that is depending Heavily on 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 agriculture that will be used for, for example, it uh, it's it's an issue that we 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 don't look at. For example, from our experience in the in the UN, we try more than one time to to get more interest in the Middle East on the biofuels, but we have it in Egypt, for example, but we don't have it in the in the peninsula because, as you see, the peninsula is is less uh, agricultural and more. Uh, depending on fossil uh, uh, energy. So, sir, given the challenges and crisis facing multilateralism, how can the G20 effectively contribute to reforming multilateral institutions and frameworks while addressing issues such as trust, legitimacy, and utility to create more inclusive and uh, efficient global order? This issue issue is related to the to the to the global political uh, tensions in the world, and it depends on on, for example, yes, we are moving out. We we moved out of the Cold War, uh, and, and 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 the new the the world order was was uh, was dominated by Western countries and the United States, uh, but but. This uh, this situation is is moving and it's very liquid and and we see for example the war in Ukraine is impacting the for the, the international relations and and I, I I forgot to tell you that one of these the the the, the absence of of China 
and Russia was uh, was a very important signal that uh, Russia is taking China or China is pushing towards a uh, uh, new world order where they 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 look for a hegemon uh, position and uh, and and that's why when I said that India's uh, G20 uh, summit was a huge success, especially because of the absence of of, of Russia and, and and China, uh, to prove uh, to the world that uh, G20 is still valid and is a very important institution uh, of, for the for the big economies. Uh, and uh, so the reforming of the international institutions in this um, confrontational mood, uh, it's, it's very difficult uh, because we need to agree on the UN on how to, or, or IMF or the World Bank on how to reform the inter, in, international institutions. And we, we will face big challenges and struggle uh, among countries with political agenda. We all agree that the BRI and the, and the IMA, IMEC, all the, they have political uh, agendas behind the economic agenda. But the, the, the outcome is how beneficial such initiative, this initiative or that initiative for the, for the population and the people in the region. And then we think that uh, the initiative of the economic the economic uh, corridor is very beneficial for all countries in 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 Asia and and and, and in Europe. Um, and we have some indicators that the the road uh, and uh, the built and road initiative, the Chinese one, is facing difficulties. Depends on. On the situation of the Chinese economy, that since sent some signals of weaknesses with with the, its its uh, its economy is slowing down, uh, its real estate uh, business is 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 facing uh, serious uh, problem, uh, serious crisis, and and also the consumer uh, expenditure in China is slowing down. So this economy. And the trillions promise for the the built road initiative is not matching, and uh, and and I think India is leading the the the, the move into towards the, the 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 new world order where we will have small big countries uh, in in the system. It not it will not be um, a uni polar system it will be multipolar system but depends on working together and understanding each other interest uh, it's it's very difficult to talk today about reforming the international institutions as they prove to be ineffective and and uh, it's very hard but within the the framework of g20 and uh, and the framework of of other international fora we can look for the the best ways of addressing our our issues and 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 grievances and uh, and work together if i could ask you ambassador yamani about india's position and in rightful place in getting the security council permanent seat what's your take on that what's really the the un security council uh, permanent seats it's really an invention of the of the of the Cold War. Uh, so, um, so after the Second World War, countries decided that they should have the permanent. Uh, now we are talking in the UN about reforming and adding countries, and India is one of these countries that they are they are promised to be member of the permanent uh, uh, members of the members permanent members of the UN Security Council. But they said that those new Comers will not have uh, a veto uh, rights. So, what's really the reforms of the UN Security Council? We think that the UN Security Council and the UN, as a, as personally, I have all these uh, ideas and I wrote about it, that the UN has to be reformed because the UN is is being transformed into an obese structure that consume more than contribute. 
to the to the to the to the development of countries and in, in the world. If you look into the budget and you see how much uh, the UN expend for 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 uh, for for logistics and bio, 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 bureaucratic uh, uh, expenses, you will understand that the UN is a, a very obese structure and need to be heavily restructured. How has the G20 summit showcased a shift in the dynamics of the influence between China and India in the global south? And what implication does this shift have for international cooperation? Good one. Um, first of all, um, I think that there is, seems to be a movement uh, to further the encirclement of China, uh, going along what Peter just said, um, so that um, so as to pressurize uh, China into an unwinnable war, uh, doing a Ukraine situation on China. Um, now, you've seen the recent uh, rapprochement between the South Korea and Japan, broken by the United States. And, and you see that the United States is trying to woo um, Indonesia as well, um, you know, to, by fair means or foul, if necessary, through the, the NED, the National Endowment for Democracy and that kind of thing. Um, if you look at the whole map, then if the, if I, Indonesia is is included in this uh, so called within Kulishima alliance, then China will be totally circled. And then, of course, the uh, hyping of the Taiwan question, um, so that uh, China will have no no other uh, um, uh, recourse but to go to war into when it's not yet ready, when when the war is unwinnable, and that would derail China, and then preserve uh, the U.S. hegemony. But at least this is the not my view, but this is this is uh, a lot of uh, narrative on this score. What I'm just trying to say is that there are lots of geopolitics involved, uh, like it or not. Uh, and then in spite of the fact that the whole world would like to have one single all-inclusive uh, platform like the G20, uh, the fact remains that there are uh, the light-minded, um, not necessarily uh, cast iron alliances, but partnerships, um, uh, for example, even NATO and um, even the European Union with the United States, uh, of course, the Quad. Um, and then on, on the, uh, the Group of South, you have the BRICS Plus, you have the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So I think that, that the, all these platforms um, have to coexist. Uh, and then the trick uh, for a global uh, world, a uh, more inclusive world, is, is really to balance the various interests. And maybe the, the model I'm thinking is the, the kind of concert of powers. Look at the what Europe was um, in, in the, 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 the late, um, in the middle, um, uh, the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, the concert of Europe lasted for 100 years without any wars, when we were at war with one un, un another. Uh, but the trick is that the, the great powers talk to one another and find some sort of a mechanism to, um, to agree on some um, basic rules of conduct. And in, in case of any infringement, they talk to one another. But what's the problem now is that um, they're talking past each other. Uh, and then um, uh, both sides seem to be, especially I think the United States, want to um, promote its hegemony in quite an unrealistic way. Uh, for example, the kind of de-risking as if this matters. Because China is so embedded in the global supply and value chain, and you need don't need to look any further than your own supermarket next to you, and to see how much China is embedded. So how are you going to do risk? You know, even the uh, a computer, uh, a mobile phone can be a risk. That everything can be a risk. You know, so that even a Chinese individual like myself could be a, a walking risk, uh, as some of the uh, Chinese students there. So I think the world needs uh, a lot of more common sense. And it's incumbent on India, on China, on the United States uh, to really uh, come up together and perhaps not formally through the kind of exchanges of what we have now, um, the so-called third track uh, interaction with think tanks and, and discussion groups. So as to promote the idea that this kind of one size fits all, um, either, you know, either win or, 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 or uh, win, uh, win or lose, uh, that kind of um, dichotomy doesn't work in the interconnected one world. We need more Metternichs and Kissinger. One is that when we talk about connectivity, uh, we very much obsessed with the BRI, but remember the International North-South Corridor uh, between uh, India and Iran, 
and uh, going on to Russia. Uh, predates by several years, by at least 10, 12 years, the BRI project. Uh, so it's not as if uh, India's uh, projects uh, of connectivity uh, are intended to compete with those of China. That is one. The second is that uh, India's ties with the Gulf uh, monarchies have become very close. And as has been mentioned, the energy security, the remittances of our, of our uh, diaspora, they are enormous in number. In the security area, they are now very close, developing very close connections between India and UAE, even Saudi Arabia and countries like uh, Oman. Uh, our military chief, for the first time ever, actually visited uh, Saudi Arabia. There is interest in uh, UAE to, to invest in India's defense manufacturing. Uh, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So our, and then because of the, and then there is this food corridor. You know, there is this big project where India can provide uh, food uh, to to this part of the world. And for that, if lines of communications can be improved, it can be a plus plus for everyone. So our goal essentially is uh, in 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 this part of the world, in the Arab world. Now, if you extend it further, you take it to Europe. Uh, fine. Uh, and if Israel can be brought in, it certainly fits into our larger um, goal. In fact, in our Haifa port uh, is uh, being managed by, by, an in, by an Indian company. So if, if if this corridor goes through Haifa and, and on to Europe, so be it. It's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. And finally, about the Chinese. Now, I think they just published a map. Uh, once again, showing large parts of India and this a new 10 dot line instead of the 9 dot line. I think the Chinese must do a little bit of introspection as to why sentiment, global sentiment is turning against them, not only in the United States, but elsewhere. Now, many ASEAN countries have protested against this map. So the Chinese cannot have it both ways, that uh, they are very confident about their centrality in global economic affairs, but they believe that there is no cost to pay when it comes to security affairs. Just say that to think that this economic corridor that the U.S. is proposing is not oppositional to China would be very naive. But that doesn't make it bad. As Henry Wallace, former vice president, once said, about the U.S.-Soviet relations, the Cold War, let's have a competition. Let's have a peaceful competition for whose ideas can best serve the needs of, of mankind. I think this is the kind of competition between the U.S. and Europe on the one hand and China and its allies on the other hand or that, that the world will benefit from. It's the militarization that I don't like to see. It's the beefing up of Taiwan as an encouraging independence that I don't like to see. Uh, it's the the chain of countries surrounding China that I don't like to see. But this is good kind of competition, especially in a world in which the richest eight people have more wealth than the poorest four billion people. So we need development and we need green development. And the point that Andrew made before about China leading the world in terms of green technologies and renewables is an important point. But we also see that China and Russia have been making a lot of headway in the Middle East. And the fact that Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, I'm pretty sure, just joined BRICS or about to join BRICS, you know, is some more impetus for the U.S. to try to counter that influence in the region. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I think that some of the things China is doing are not helpful. This new map that was that was just released is going to increase tensions and and, uh, and not a step and, and China does need to look at the impact of many of its policies that are helping that are not helping China that I think are legitimizing the opposition to China so I think we do need a lot more collaboration yeah. and if we can work together between the United States and China for world development that would be even better but if not let's at least compete for economic development 
and serving the needs of, of people around the planet and building something positive. I'm sure India has started outreach to its um, neighborhood and um, like neighbor first policy uh, that, that has started a long time back. Uh, broader um, South Asia and the African region is something that India also has started, not just because or for uh, G20, but uh, what we saw now is the outcomes of that policy. Uh, India has, uh, a apart from its foreign policy that always has been balancing, um, India has a lot of uh, funds, a lot of people, a lot of uh, business-minded uh, people um, and its own technologies and you know strategies that it can export. So, um, for example, when I saw the latest news around uh, a month back that India is taking not just its UPI technology or you know UPI system to Africa, but it is sharing. Uh, it is helping the African countries to develop their own. Uh, technologies based on the UPI framework. Uh, this is a very different approach. One thing is like what the Western countries have been doing in Global South, in Russia, they have been coming and selling the product or technology, selling it. They would never share it, right? Uh, only now uh, they have started slowly sharing some technologies, for example, in defense, because Indian government brought up that policy. Uh, so these these are the shifts, and uh, it is for the Western countries who have the technology to, you know, either play that game or not, or lose the market, which is huge, just given the population. So I think India's uh, approach um, towards other regions uh, to be a partner, to be a technological partner, or you know, even a geopolitical partner, and rather than just seller. It's very important, and this is what other countries should really look at and learn from it, because it's a very long-term policy, uh, long-term process. It doesn't give you the benefits immediately, but uh, you know, uh, we have to live in this on this planet <laughs> for quite a long time. Uh, so I think that kind of a long-term vision uh, that India has uh, is is a is a perfect example for the other countries. Obviously, very apparent is that we often talk about the, the divisions uh, and the tensions between the West and the Global South, but we and we tend to sort of lump the create a monolithic entity of the Global South when we know, in fact, it's not monolithic. That there are many a number of fairly powerful countries. There are a number of mid-sized powers. There are some countries that that are not very that are not powerful at all. And that there are national interests which which clash, uh, even in the global south, uh, and that you know that's not a criticism, that's just reality. And I think sometimes the way in which we couch our rhetoric by using terms like the global south uh, disguise that. What what we have to and 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 in in one way the ability. Of, of the Delhi summit to, to have a declaration, even if we had two important leaders of the global, uh, uh, two important leaders of the G20 not present, was the fact that there should be a space like the G20, where the discussion is on global economic governance, that there should be a space there for countries, regardless of their differences, to be able to at least uh, engage on a number of critical issues to everybody. So we, you know, that's been an argument we've made on the Ukraine war, and, and it's also an argument in terms of the 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 growing tensions between between China and India. I think there is a degree of competition there, uh, also for uh, who will be the leader. Although I, I prefer to say that there are a number of leaders in the global south. Uh, and India is clearly one such leader, and there, may, there are others. Um, but I think it, it is important not only for preserving certain spaces so that we can move forward on development and, and, and economic governance, but also to help us manage these tensions, whether they are between the West 
and the rest, or whether they are between two leaders within the global south. Um, because if we cannot manage these tensions, then we're going to actually end up in a war. And nobody wants war. Your prime minister made that quite clear. You know, There's not the time for war. So we all need to, to develop mechanisms um, and, 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 and uh, mechanisms for managing but also platforms where we can come together because we have we do have certain common interests, even if we disagree with others. Now, I know that that might sound very idealistic, and I realize that, you know, that's not the way the world works, but we certainly have to uh, at least try to manage. We're not going to manage everything, but I think we, we have to, to try to, to, to manage uh, uh, as much as we possibly can so that we can focus on development rather than uh, than becoming consumed by geopolitical uh, tensions. I wanted to show who, who, who will be leading the Global South, who will be leading the interests of the Global South. And uh, and we see that China and and, 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 uh, and we see India and, and South Africa and, and Brazil more representative and, and Saudi Arabia more representative of the Global South than we see China. And if you see the, 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 the political agenda that is very clear when China was investing in Africa and you see the exploitation of African uh, resources and, uh, and the conditionalities of that co cooperation, you understand that China can never be a representative of the global south. But, uh, uh, but this is the case. And, uh, and uh, this uh, G20 India and the G20 Brazil will show more participation of the global south in the, in the uh, decision making of 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 the, the 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 world thank you so much as we draw a round table discussion on india's historic g20 presidency to a close i would like to extend my gratitude to our illustrious panelists for their valuable insights and thoughtful analysis of the summit's outcomes and the broader implications for India's global standing. Thank you all for joining us today and may our discussion serve as a catalyst for further understanding and collaborations on the pressing issues that shape our global landscape. Good day to you all. Thank you so much, everybody.